All right, folks, we are back for another rip snorting episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast. Of course, I am joined by my partner in crime, Amy Hollenkamp, RD. Say hello, everybody. Say hello. Hello. Technically, I was telling everybody to say hello to you. Oh, okay. But Sorry. But that's okay. We're going to take it. You can be part of everybody. We're all, we're all one at the end of the day, right? I was saying hello to you. Oh, but we already said hello. We've been chatting for five or 10 minutes before we hit record. That's true. That's okay. The good people don't know that. So we're just going to run with it. So guys, today we're going to be talking about low stomach acid. And before you tune out, before you think, guys, you've already talked about this before. And Dr. Deneza has videos on her channel. And like, I already know everything about stomach acid. Nay, my friend, nay. We have hot new stuff that we can tell you about. So stay tuned for potentially an eye-opening episode. I know I'm setting the bar really high right now. Oh my God. Um, do you want, so that being said, do you want to have the opening statement here? Wow. After no pressure. That, after that, whoa. Um, yeah. You know, when it comes to symptoms, I'm, I'm never surprised how much digestive insufficiency can drive symptoms in and of them in and of themselves. Like I feel like sometimes people are so locked into everything going on downstream that they miss some of these huge pieces upstream, like having low stomach acid. They just yeah. think everything they're experiencing is from microbes. And it's like, no, <laughs> nay, you have some, uh, some digestive insufficiency potentially. Not everybody has this. So I don't want to set the stage that, that, every person has low stomach acid. But a fair amount of people do though. That's the wild true. thing. Very true. And I will make the argument too, even if you are dealing with something intrinsically microbial in nature, the root cause of the root cause could mm -hmm. still be digestive insufficiency, namely low stomach acid or poor bile flow. Right. So it's it's like yes, dysbiosis or SIBO can be a root cause, but there's almost always a root of a root of a root. So don't just stop at dysbiosis or SIBO. You need to trace it back. And honestly, there's only a handful of legitimate root causes. Because I would make the same argument. Low stomach acid is not a root <laughs> cause per se. We need to trace back and ask, well, why is my body having a hard time making stomach acid? And spoiler alert, it does go back to a lot of the unsexy basics that we like to talk about on this podcast. But we're gonna we're gonna take you on the full journey. So don't you worry, we'll kind of we'll we'll start off maybe do you think that it's worthwhile talking about how digestion affects our ability to digest our food, but also how it might influence microbes? I feel like those could be two good starting points in the beginning of the episode. Or should we lead with some stomach, low stomach acid symptoms? We always forget to do this, by the way. We talk about something and we get all nerdy and excited. And then 50 minutes into the episode, we'll be like, oh, here are the symptoms of what we're talking <laughs> about, by the way. So can we lead with symptoms, actually? Yeah. Make that request. I, when it comes to low stomach acid, a lot of what I hear is sometimes early satiety, early fullness, indigestion, bloating. Um, I think that sometimes you can have nausea is another mm. one that I've heard. Um, I think that you can also have just bloating more quickly upon eating. So could could be similar to a full type feeling, so early fullness. But just feeling like <laughs> feeling like things are just kind of sitting high up. But to me, it's important to maybe make note of when you're experiencing the symptoms. Because if it's fairly quickly upon eating, I would be more suspicious that there's a stomach acid problem versus someone that might say, oh, bloating is fine after breakfast and then it kind of gets a little bit worse after lunch and then it gets worse after dinner where it feels like it's not necessarily connected to to a really short period of time post post prandial or post meal so that i think is a crucial indicator is you know how quickly it comes on after yeah. eating yeah that makes sense to me and i agree i think that Probably the the classic, like if somebody put me on a game show and said, what are the symptoms of low stomach acid? Ready, go. 
I would say a lot of the same. I think that the way I've described one of them is a feeling like your food sits in your gullet like a brick of lead. Mm. Like a lot of people kind of identify with that feeling. So it's it's indigestion, but it's it's that like stuck, heavy, heavy kind of feeling. Heavy. And yeah. that can also overlap with postprandial or postmeal fullness, which I think mm-hmm. is spot on as well. But it's it's literally like the food gets in your stomach in that it's just not being processed and it's not getting moved out of the stomach in an efficient, timely manner because of the low stomach acid. So yeah, the feeling like food is sitting in your gullet like a brick of lead, postprandial, postmeal fullness, uh, bloating, certainly. And um, I've seen both diarrhea and constipation be related to low stomach acid. Mm -hmm. I think that those symptoms are less specific. You can have constipation for many different reasons. You can have diarrhea for many different reasons versus I think the brick feeling is pretty slam dunk-ish for low stomach acid. So I wouldn't hang my hat if you only had diarrhea or constipation, but I have seen those things resolve many, many times doing a betaine HCL challenge. Right. Well, it's almost uh, interesting, like you were saying before, the root cause of potentially some of your microbiome issues could be related to pH not being necessarily where you want it to be. Um, And making sure that the stomach is acidic, which then affects the pH of the small intestines and everything kind of downstream could make a big, big impact on the microbiome and could change stool. So it's yeah. a more of like a, a little bit of an indirect, direct effect. I don't know how to d- describe yeah, it. Like it's l- not necessarily downstream, right? It's not necessarily like maybe that fixing the stomach acid in and of itself is what fixes the constipation or diarrhea, but maybe the effects downstream have a role on what bugs are growing and what bugs aren't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's always fascinating to me when someone has a change in bowel movement just from taking HCL. Because um, yeah. I've definitely seen that too. And you're like, whoa, this is wild. Um, and probably just digesting better also helps too um, for a variety of reasons. It might not totally be just microbial. So... Yeah, it's... Well, there's also a motility element to it, too. Right. So uh, we talked about... I think these were our first two episodes back after you had CC. So this would be like episode 101, 102 kind of stuff. We talked about the north to south digestive process, but Mm -hmm. you need proper stomach acidity to stimulate the gallbladder and pancreas and prompt them to release their juices, Mm -hmm. including bicarbonate, which neutralizes the acid, but also bile and enzymes. And bile flow in particular seems to be really important for motility in the MMC. So, you know, even, yes, that could translate to resolving diarrhea or constipation, but it could also translate to less bloating, better FODMAP tolerance, better tolerance of mm. carbohydrates, like less sibo feeling stuff mm. if you have proper stomach acidity. Right. No, totally. It's... It's all connected. It's the web we weave. (laughs) But can I throw out another one? And I know you know this, but I'm going to share this with the people. Yes, More so than anything, but I still expect you to do like some theatrical, ah, kind of thing. You you know, put on your acting face for this. So guys, gather around. I've been doing a little experiment behind the scenes, BTS, if you will, And I haven't even posted this on YouTube. Literally, the only people who know about this are Amy, my husband, and my FODMAP Freedom students, because I've talked about that in the Q&As with them. So I have been following my ferritin for a while, like a couple years, and it's been low-key meh. It hasn't (sighs) been terrible. It hasn't been below 15 or anything bad like that, but it hasn't been above 50 either. It's been in that like upper 30s, high 40s kind of range. And it's been driving me bonkers. And I've tried all the normal things. I took an iron supplement. It did nothing. I tried to boost iron in my diet. It did nothing. I tried discontinuing a calcium supplement I had started. Nothing. I discontinued my magnesium supplement that I take at bedtime. Nothing. I've been losing my mind. And I 
I still remember. So it was after I tried uh, cutting out the magnesium supplement, right? And I had done that for three months. I got my blood drawn. The results came in and I had Amy on Marco Polo and I was like, this is it, man. This is it. And I get out there and not only did it not make a difference, my ferritin went down <laughs> and it was the worst it had ever been. And I was like, gosh, darn it, Amy, I give up. What do I do? And then I had this epiphany. and I was like, oh, there is one thing I have not tried yet. Betaine HCL. But here's the weird thing. I have none of the digestive symptoms. Mm -hmm. I get no bloating, no abdominal pain, no nausea, indigestion. I don't have the brick of lead feeling. It just... I have no digestive symptoms whatsoever of low stomach acid, mm. but I did an experiment. I took betaine HCL for three months and I changed nothing else. Like I, I verified with chronometer. I ate pretty much the same amount of iron, maybe even a tiny bit less iron than I had in the three months prior. And my ferritin went up 19 points. Yeah. It's crazy. This is your theatrical one. Come on. Oh, my God. There. Whoa. There you go. Whoa, yes. Nelly. <laughs> so Amy's always the first to know these things, so she's not genuinely right. surprised. But it was bonkers that, again, I changed nothing else. I didn't change my iron intake. I didn't change any of my other supplements. I didn't, I, I didn't change anything. <laughs> so clearly, I've had a, like asymptomatic low stomach acid this whole t or mm. for a while. And it occurred to me the first time I saw my stomach acid looking particularly craptacular was May of 2020. Mm. <laughs> so I think that that's so I, I will say if you have low iron or low ferritin of a mystery origin, and you've tried the normal things like an iron supplement and getting enough iron through your food, and you're not like a vegetarian or a vegan, because there's absorption mm. issues with plant based iron. If you've tried the normal things like I have, and you didn't get your ferritin to budge, you might have low stomach acid and not realize mm. it like me. But going back to what I said, that that seemed to be especially notable in May of 2020 and onward. Well, what was happening in the world? The world was ending. It was complete and utter insanity. And mm. all of us were really stressed. I at That was at the time when I was losing a ton of hair from stress. And I was about to pick up the painting hobby to try to mitigate my stress a little bit. But it kind of makes sense, honestly, that I was under a lot of stress. My vagus nerve was fried to a damn crisp. My vagal tone was down. And that resulted in poor stomach acid production, and maybe poor bile flow, poor enzyme production, poor motility. Like there's a whole Pandora's box that you get to mm. open up when you start talking about poor vagal tone. But I think that that mechanism of stress, or even like kind of trauma almost from that year for all of us, stress reducing my vagal tone, and then that affecting my ability to make stomach acid, like I think that that all makes sense now that I've put two and two together. But uh I, I'm planning for this to be the last YouTube video I put on my channel, but at the end of the year, so sometime between Christmas and New Year's, I'm going to do a video on this because I'm in the throes of taking betaine HCL for another three months, and then I'm going to get another data point on my ferritin. And if the trend continues and I prove this to be a thing, uh, you could bet your butt that I'm going to talk about on a YouTube video. So yeah. stay tuned. No, it's so cool. I love your your experiments. I love too that you have the chronometer data to confirm that the iron level is the same because that's so crazy. Or maybe even a I little lower. Like, yeah, like you I said. think that's the wildest part. Yeah, it's I not really, like anything really shifted. It's just the no. HCL supplementation. Um, yeah. Yeah, in the the stress piece. I, I I mean, speaking of COVID and just stress broadly, but with COVID, I still think that <laughs> we're kind of operating in a slightly more disconnected world in general. I, I think about that often, like just the, the bar has almost gone down in terms of the level of connection. And I don't think many people have totally restored it. I know I feel like I haven't, I've probably disconnected from more friends just because like during COVID there was less going on. And that it's just longer and longer between stretches of talking to someone. Um, and then, you know, people are working from home. So they're more disconnected from their work communities. Um, 
I do think that COVID changed the landscape of, especially with connection, which is so important to vagal tone in a lot of ways and kind of traumatized people for a long period of time um, that we're still maybe dealing with the ramifications from. Oh, I, <laughs> I think, think so too. I think most of the time we think, oh, it's it's mostly resolved, but the fallout is still present in, in many ways from maybe people that I've worked with. I've seen it, the fallout be, be there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy, but I, stress overall is definitely going to be a huge factor for stomach acid, which I know we've talked, we talked about in the original, yeah. um, the original low stomach acid discussion that we had, but still super important to mention because <laughs> sometimes we're blind to the level of stress we have or, or our heads down, um, cause we're doing so many other things, but just taking a moment to do, um, things that are going to nourish your nervous system, help resolve stress, promote more joy. All those things are going to be helpful to, uh, stomach acid. <laughs> you could take all the HCL yeah. supplements in the world and that might support you, um, and help your digestion function more optimally but it's not necessarily a root causal approach. Now, if you want to do that and not, <laughs> not manage your stress, then like by all means, I'm not, no judgment, but um, probably the root of the root <laughs> of the, the low stomach acid, like you said, is so many unsexy basics, stress yeah. management and vagal tone. Um, I think and I, possibly sleep could be involved too. Oh yeah. Cause sleep is going to affect the nervous system and then that's going to have an indirect effect on a vagal function as well. Um, even, yeah. you know, I know we just did a gut brain axis and a vagus nerve episode more recently, but even things like blood sugar, you mm -hmm. know, there's that one wacky study where they measured the cross-sectional um, um, diameter, I think, of the vagus nerve in healthy, normal people versus diabetics. And diabetics have a puny wussy little vagus nerve by comparison. And it's the hypothesis is that the high blood sugar for a prolonged period of time has nuked their vagus nerve. So even on sexy basics, like managing your blood sugar. So everybody needs to go keto right now is what that means. And everybody needs to take lots and lots of berberine and yeah. never, eat never eat carbs sugar again. again. Never. Yeah. Because they're evil. Never, ever, ever, ever. We all ever. know they're evil. Right. No, we're kidding. We're, <laughs> for those of you who this right. is your first episode with us, we're being extremely sarcastic right, right now. Um, yeah, the blood sugar thing. The wild thing about blood sugar, not to go off on too, too much of a tangent, but everybody knows at this point that we love tangents. But Squirrel? The, the, <laughs> the blood sugar thing. I was just having a conversation with a new client yesterday. Um, I swear... I see people with energy fluctuations more often than not. It's a nutrition or slash blood sugar related event that they're maybe contributing to something else. Now, again, I think other factors can definitely play into like fatigue and energy, but more often, more often than not, I see people blaming that on some sort of gut related thing. But in reality, it typically resolves once nutrition gets better and more optimized and then blood sugar is better and more optimized. Um, so I, again, blood sugar is such a huge one and just how you overall feel, but I think you're right. It's, it's so important for vagal tone, which again, if, if your nervous system's struggling, you're just not going to digest well or move food well or do anything well gut wise. So it, it's so pivotal in so many ways. Um, but yeah, it taking a serious look at your stress is always going to be important. And that's definitely still the case with low stomach acid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in a way, getting back to the idea of the root of the root of the root, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, because our ability to make stomach acid is dictated by signaling from the vagus nerve 
And vagal nerve activation is contingent on brain activity. And basically, the brain tells the vagus nerve to do something, and then the vagus nerve tells the gut to do something. That's mm -hmm. the chain of command. Right. So really, this could open a huge Pandora's box of keeping your nervous system healthy, just right. period. So I think I mentioned this in the gut brain axis episode we did more recently, you know, going back to what do neurons need to be happy and healthy? They need good, stable blood sugar, enough, enough fuel is another way to say mm. that they need a good oxygen supply. So guess what, if you're anemic, <laughs> or you have like super crazy low blood pressure, that could be impairing your ability to make stomach acid even in a roundabout way. Um, and your brain also needs stimulation. Mm. So for me, like looking at me right now, so I'm going to use myself as a case study right now. Um, I think stress has obviously played a big role. I think obvious based on the timing, at least. But I've talked about this on, on the podcast before. I think that I've historically been really out of touch with my stress level. Yeah. And it's weird to say that. But even, even in this current day and age... I think a lot of people around me can't always tell when I'm stressed because I'm gen I'm really even keeled, mm. but I just like bottle it up and shove it down. And then my body has to let me know in these weird ways that something is up. So like during the, the lockdown, I was losing tons of hair and mm -hmm. that was my body screaming at me, Hey, something's up. Right. You're not as cool as you think you are. <laughs> the right. world is ending and you're freaking out on the inside, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. So I think that I still have more to unpack there because you're right. Taking betaine HCL forever and ever is an option. And again, if that's what you want to do and you just want to pack away your demons and not acknowledge them and you just want to take the Band-Aid and be done with it, that's your prerogative. But my prerogative is I do want to work on some of my stuff. So I'm still kind of working on the whole stress thing. But, um, you know, even, even beyond that, I think I've shared before, I have not been super diligent about exercise in mm -hmm. years and years. I, I'll go in spurts where I'm more diligent about it. But if life throws me a curveball, or I'm working out a big project, or we move or something, there will be many, many months after that, that I'm kind of at a funk and I'm not exercising. So one of the things I'm hoping to get back to in this holiday season is doing a little bit more movement and exercise, just like yeah. walking around the neighborhood and maybe lifting weights in my house a time or two a week, nothing crazy. But I know that movement and getting outside in the daylight hours and getting that bright sunlight on my eyeballs for even a minute during the middle of the day, those are two really good ways that I could stimulate my nervous system and therefore stimulate my vagus nerve. And I'm just, I'm currently not doing them. So, um, so yeah, those are a couple of things that I'm kind of thinking through for my own self right now. Yeah, no, I sounds like some great goals to help with stress reduction. Miss Lady. I need to paint more. Yeah. The wall has looked very much the same for a while. I need to add to the wall again. Can I also mention one other thing that came up when you were talking? No, you can't. <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> I just I just want to point one thing out that so you were saying, you know, obviously the goal for you is to not be able to take not taking baiting HCL. But in your case, it's so interesting because you already talked about how it's important for your body to have enough ox or for the nervous system to have enough oxygen to stimulate, to be able to stimulate the nerves and things like that to produce stomach acid um, for the messaging from the nervous system to happen. And again, because your iron's low, it's so interesting. You know, you by getting the iron levels up with betaine HCL, it could certainly help your own HCL production. So that's yep. a really interesting twist in your case. And I'd imagine that's a case for some people that have low iron. You know, if you're really stuck in a low iron state, taking some extra digestive support like betaine HCL could be valuable to help get your levels up so that you're able to absorb, um, digest the iron and absorb it better. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that it's, it's really interesting. You're I don't know. It's, yeah, it's it's fun. Again, I'm enjoying using myself as a case study. Um, 
I think you're right. Now, luckily, I haven't ever become anemic in all of this. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple little blips where my hemoglobin is just like a smidge lower than I want it to be right. from a functional perspective. But I I haven't looked anemic and I haven't felt anemic really. So I've lucked up in that regard. But there is some speculation and I think some research that even low ferritin in the absence of anemia on a CBC could still result in some symptoms like fatigue and brain fog. Mm -hmm. So it is curious. I will say I haven't noticed any perceived difference in how right. I feel right. across the board. Because again, my gut feels the same. Right. And I have not felt any difference in energy or brain function. So it, yeah, it's it's really curious. But I I'm going to continue the experiment for a bit longer. And then I think it's a matter of kind of getting my ferritin up to the point where I'm happy with it and then maintaining with some little dose of betaine HCL for a while while I work on some of the bigger root mm. causes. Here's another fun little tidbit about me. And I think I might have shared this with you, Amy, but I'm not positive. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have done the betaine HCL challenge before, and I'm one of those people who can go up to the moon. Like there's, reach, there's no stopping Reach me. for the stars. <laughs> yeah. So often, so for those of you guys who don't know, this will be a good segue into talking about that challenge. Uh, I've, I've seen it done different ways, but this is how I usually coach people on doing the Betaine HCL challenge is I have them start the first day of the experiment with one capsule of Betaine HCL per meal, and they do the whole day at that dose. If they feel no change or if they feel better, then they progress. And on day two, they take two capsules with every meal. If they feel the same or better, they progress up to three and so on and so forth until you either hit a ceiling, which is going to be that you get heartburn and you feel like, ooh, that was too much. That's cool. At that point, you just take a little bit of baking soda or half a Tums. You shave off that excess and then you go, cool, now I know my ceiling. I can't go past that. Done deal. Um you either keep going until you hit a ceiling or you keep going until you find a dose that's just impractical to keep taking. So right. nobody in their right mind wants to take 20 capsules of betaine HCL with every meal. That's absurd and cost prohibitive and just silly. But, hmm. you know, where people feel that that impracticality is going to be different, a lot of people will get up to like, eight or 10 capsules and feel like that's kind of their limit. They're not willing to go past. I have a guy in FODMAP Freedom right now. He's gotten up to like 14 capsules of betaine HCL and he's kind of playing with that right now. I, it doesn't sound like it's been super impactful for him. So I think that I'm going to encourage him to sort of move on from that part of the experiment in the program. But, mm. um, but anyway, I'm one of those people who can go up and up and up and never feel it. And I'm still wrapping my head around this. I don't know if that is a symptom of low stomach acid in and of itself or not. A lot of people will say the more betaine HCL you can take, hmm. the lower your stomach acid is. Like, ooh, you need that much more acid to reacidify your stomach. Holy crap. But I don't know if that's true because there's there's got to be other variables at play. Hmm. And... I just, I don't know if that's true, but it is an interesting side note that I'm one of those people who can go way up to the moon and never feel it from the betaine HCL challenge. You know, like, watch me go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, mom, 20 at once. It's no. like your, For, uh, your talent show item. <laughs> yeah. Do you, could you very imagine? Very talent show. Do you imagine? I can. <laughs> we should hold a talent show and it's going to be the most random thing on planet Earth. It's going to be amazing. Oh my but, gosh. Uh, but no, for, for what it's worth, because I know I could dose it really high, and so I don't really have a good understanding of where I needed to be for this experiment. Mm -hmm. What I ended up doing for the first three months is I would take like zero or one or two capsules with breakfast because I'm just not feeling taking a ton of pills at mm -hmm. breakfast personally. And then for lunch and dinner, I was taking five, maybe six capsules, and that was where I hunkered for the three months. Mm -hmm. For this iteration, I am bumping it up just a little bit because now I'm excited. And now I want to I want to see where I can go with this. So now I'm taking like six to eight with lunch and dinner and maybe like two with breakfast. So I'm really mm -hmm. emphasizing lunch and dinner primarily because that's where right. I would eat my dietary iron typically. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not doing an absurdly high dose, like 20 per meal or something. I'm doing 
six or eight per meal right now, which is high, but it's not absurdly high in my opinion. Right. Yeah. That's wild. I am very interested to, to see how this ex- little experiment plays out. I know. I know. Well, um, you'll be the first to know. I know I will be. So everybody else, sorry. Yeah. You'll find Everyone out else eventually. Could be envious. Yeah. Right. Well, fi- like I said, uh, keep an eye on my YouTube channel at the end of the year. Uh, I'm Dr. Deneza Gut Microbiome Queen is my YouTube handle. And yeah, I'm going to, I'll do a video one way or another about the experiment at the end of the year. So it'll be between Christmas and New Year. Yeah. Well, I'd imagine too, by the time this comes out, it's going to be closer. Yeah. It will because this episode is going to post in mid-November, I think. Right. And we're like in October still. Yeah. Surprise! We're from the past. <laughs> the ghost of <laughs> the ghost of Christmas past. Um, yeah, I you know, we'd be a little remiss. I I always have to do this uh, where we talk about nutrition, but I swear to all that is holy that nutrition plays such a huge role in digestive capacity across the board. If you don't have enough fuel, you're not going to make enough stomach or enough stomach acid slash all the digestive juices slash anything, right? Hormones, slash anything. Yep. neurotransmitters. Yep. It's like you're operating at a budget. And so the body's going to cut things it feels are not necessarily life-saving, um, you know, only the essentials, which the body doesn't necessarily read stomach acid as super essential. So it might make some, but not well, enough. And to go to the classic thing that everybody talks about, when you're in fight or flight mode, when you're stressed out, the body thinks on some level that you're being chased by a saber tooth tiger. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should change that dialogue. Like what else could we be chased by that would be more exciting? A bear? T-Rex? A polar bear? T-Rex? Ooh. Well, then we get the into the whole Jurassic conversation Park. of like, did humans ever coexist with dinosaur kind of thing? And maybe yeah. we don't want to go down that what rabbit about, hole. What about something just like an ostrich or something? Because that would be kind of freaky. Ostriches are mean. Yeah. I know. Yeah, okay. Know. Birds we're going to go with this mean. now. Yeah, we're going to go with this. So you're getting chased by an ostrich and that's what your nervous system believes when you're in fight or flight mode. So what do you need in the moment when you're running from this ostrich? You need muscles. So Mm -hmm. all of your resources go to your skeletal muscles, like your quads and your glutes and your hamstrings and your biceps. And that way you could run or climb up a tree to escape from this thing. And you need your lungs and your heart so that you can, you know, get enough oxygen to the muscles to do their job. So that's how you allocate resources when you're in fight or flight mode. Digestion in the heat of the moment, when you're running away from the vicious ostrich is actually not essential. Neither is reproduction, neither is feeling good, (laughs) like making serotonin and making dopamine and and just feeling good. Good sleep, non-essential, because you're sure as heck not going to sleep when you're running away from the ostrich. So I, I think that sometimes that's a disconnect because people will say, or people might think, well, wait, but digestion is obviously essential for life. So why would my body not prioritize Mm. it? It's like, no, no, no. If you have 30 seconds to run away, what is needed in that moment versus what can you wait a few hours or a few days on? The thing is, if you're always in fight or flight all day, every day for years or decades on end, you never get that reprieve. Mm -hmm. And that's where stress can become dangerous. Right. Right. It's the chronic nature of it that Mm -hmm. gets really squirrely when it comes to digestion. Um, But yeah, I always think of it, chronic stress, it's always like the reproductive system is one of the first things to go. So like libido falls, a lot of women lose their periods, and then it's digestion. I think they kind of trick, it goes down the list. It's like, well, we definitely don't need a baby right now. Like, well, we'll cross that off. And then they go to digestion and cross that off. But yeah, I, I, I think nutrition can be inherently super stressful if you're not getting enough. Um, so that's the, the big thing. Stressful on the body, you mean? Rest, right. Yeah. It's like a it's physical a stressor. Stress. It's a physical stressor. Um, yeah. I think we think of, we typically think of stress as emotional, mental, um, but there's a lot of physical stressors like sleep, um, you know, 
like not getting enough movement, like all those things can stress the body out in different ways. But nutrition is definitely a stressor. Um, and I think there's other specific nutrients that could be of concern too. Um, I do think magnesium is one it's needed to operate the pump to bring in some hydrogen ions to make HCL. Um, so magnesium is going to be important when it comes to stomach acidity. Um, chloride is going to be important too. Uh, so, you know, making sure you have some salt in the diet <laughs> might make sense. Don't have Does, to tell me twice. I know. It doesn't necessarily, I feel like some people are really intense on the salt. Have you seen some like providers that are like, you just need more salt. And it's oh. like, well, do you, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like I haven't assessed your diet. Some people might need to add salt, but yeah, I, I haven't experienced that personally so much, but I've mm. seen that on the internet. There was one guy who wrote a book about like, you need tons of salt and that was popular mm. for a while. So, right. um, yeah, I, I do think it's out there. I don't think I've experienced it personally with my patients though, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, you know, you're right. You need, you know, HCl, you need hydrogen and chloride to mm -hmm. make stomach acid. You need, um, you even, you need protein to make enzymes. Yep. So mm -hmm. things like pepsin, ironically, that helps you digest protein. You actually need protein to make pepsin. So mm -hmm. just dietary protein in general could play a role. Um, you're right. Magnesium zinc, I think is also mm -hmm. needed to make stomach acid on some level. I forget the mechanism now. Yeah. Um, we had talked with Thomas Easley way back when in episode 30 something, yeah. and he brought up the idea that parietal cells have just boatloads of mitochondria. They're just, they're like stuffed to the gills with mitochondria because it's such an energy intensive process to push hydrogen ions against such a strong gradient. So you need tons and tons of energy to mm. make stomach acid, which he hearkened it back to iron and blood flow. And if you have low ferritin or if you are anemic, heaven forbid, you're not going to get the oxygen delivery to run those mitochondria. And then you're not going to have the energy to use the mitochondria and use the parietal cells. But also, this could harken back to calories and just, are you eating enough, mm -hmm. right? Because even if you have the best blood flow in the whole wide world and you have all the oxygen in the whole wide world, if the mitochondria don't have any substrate to make ATP out of, yeah. then you don't get ATP. So just eating enough, period, and getting enough calories can be super important for this as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I was recommending I was I actually was gonna listen to or I listened to I should say the Elena Kunicki episode we did because mm. it had been forever since we interviewed her and I just wanted to rem I wanted to listen to it back to see if it was appropriate for this particular client um, and it was interesting listening to that episode because she talks about a lot how much low energy intake or low calories leads to bad di digestion and a lot of the symptoms that you see in SIBO, like she even mentions that, like a lot of SIBO ass symptoms get better just by eating more. Um, and I think she was saying she had reflux and stuff and a lot of upper GI things that just went away once she started eating more. And, and again, some of that too probably leads to less stress when you're so, um, less emotional mental stress uh, when you're so restricted or strict diet wise and you kind of allow yourself to loosen the reins and you come at the diet in a different way. Um, it, pr it definitely probably affects mental and emotional stress too. So there could be other components with yeah. it, but it, it is a really good episode if, if you are someone where you're like, oh, I, I think I'm under eating. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of pretty much most of my clients are. Um, so that could be a good episode to check out too, just because we talk a lot about the digestive capacity deficits that come yeah. in with low intake. But you're certainly right. Again, I remember us talking specifically about the gradient and everything. 
but it is just you need to make sure you're getting enough energy to, to support the mitochondria that are there. Yeah. Um, well, but yeah. And thinking back, sorry, I think I cut you off there, but no, you're thinking good. back, you know, Krebs cycle and then mitochondrial beta oxidation, you also need a whole boatload of B vitamins and mm-hmm. minerals to do that. So even our basic vitamin and mineral kind of stuff becomes important. Right. There's so many things that we probably don't understand how how important nutrition is specifically. Like you're just your best bet is to just try to cover as many nutritional bases as you can um, and trying to eat a nutrient dense diet um, with a lot of variety. So you have a lot more coverage um, of nutrients. But yeah, you're right. And there's a lot of dietitians now and I I haven't really deep dove as much into it. I, I've been curious about getting some mineral supplementation type supplements that I've seen some of my RD friends um, have designed some cool mineral products. I've done some electrolytes and things, which again are very similar. Um, but yeah, the, some people swear by minerals, you know, bumping up minerals being super impactful for their health. I think in general, anytime you work on just nutrient density, you're probably going to get some benefits and some could be really obvious, you know, oh, if your electrolyte balance is better, maybe you 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 perform better in whatever activity you do, or maybe you have a little bit more stable energy, like some stuff you would typically see, but you know, some of the stuff could inherently just help gut function and there's not really tons of research on it at this point. And there probably won't be because it's, there's not probably tons of money to fund research that shows how every nutrient or vitamin and mineral affects stomach acid. Um, well, there's so, money to be had suppressing stomach acid, not right. necessarily boosting it. Right. For sure. So, it is what it is. <sighs> it is what it is. Yeah. But yeah, I guess uh, to to go back to the unsexy basics, nutrition matters. <laughs> right. I know. Uh, but not a SIBO specific diet, IBS specific diet, GERD specific diet, like just nutrition for humans. Mm. If you took nutrition 101 in undergrad, what would they teach you in that class mm-hmm. kind of stuff? Um, yeah. I wonder, can you hypothesize, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can oh, you God. hypothesize if carbs specifically would be, because so we talked about calories in general, we talked about protein. Can you think of any plausible mechanism why carbohydrate intake specifically could be important for stomach acid? And it's okay if I'm putting you on the spot too much at in the moment. No, it, it's okay. Um, you know, I think metabolically, just in general, if carbs dip too low and it starts to affect hormones, it certainly could affect stomach acidity or gut function in general. So, you know, if thyroid starts to dip, if cortisol starts to rise, it could affect, um, you know, the stomach in various ways. I also wonder just a little bit about, you know, people going low carb are usually just inherently eating tons of fat, which could lead to, you know, delayed motility in the stomach and could lead to kind of some stomachy symptoms that feel very low stomach acid based, which I don't necessarily know if it's more from low stomach acid or more just from gastroparesis or some, some stuff slowing down because, you know, stomach emptying might slow down if fats get a little bit too high. Well, and briefly, just to elaborate on what you're saying, because you know, the people who listen to us, they're going to go Google and be like, fat's bad now. Right. And no, that's not what so, I'm saying. It's more no, like the, the ratio. If the ratio is yeah, too high, some balance. People, yeah. Well, and there is at least a little bit of research. And I think it is with stomach, stomach emptying specifically, that carbs leave the stomach quickest, mm-hmm. then protein leaves the stomach the next quickest and fat takes a much longer time to leave the stomach. So you could say that it del- a high fat meal would delay gastric emptying somewhat. Like I don't want you to think that fat is intrinsically bad or evil or you should cut it out, but the idea is if you're eating fat and carbs and protein in balance and you're getting, you know, 30-40% of your calories from any of those three macros, it's probably fine. 
But if you're way overdoing it on the fat and you're doing keto or you're trying to do keto, you actually might have delayed stomach emptying because of that. And that's maybe part of why people say, oh, I feel so full on keto. Mm -hmm. You might feel full longer because your stomach emptying is delayed and that gives you the perceived feeling of fullness. But that also may or may not be a great thing for motility, actually. So just for what it's worth. And I think that that motility delay and the stomach emptying delay could result in postprandial fullness or Mm -hmm. the brick feeling that I mentioned before. So it can kind of masquerade as low stomach acid to some degree or another. Yeah. So you're right. You're dead on. I, you know, this is not to demonize fat, but if someone is taking things to extremes, that's usually where you could feel various ways. Now, again, you'll, you'll always run into the exception to that rule where someone could be thriving on low fat or low carb and higher fats. I typically don't see that long term, um, you know, keto esque type stuff long term or carnivore or something long term, which carnivore again is not necessarily just fats, but it, I think you could have weird motility stuff come up from carnivore or keto that, like you said, masquerade in a weird way, like low stomach acidity. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in general, meeting your nutritional needs usually works better if you have a good balance of all the macros. Um, and so if you are getting a good balance of the macros, you're going to get probably a, a better profile of vitamins and minerals um, which is going to be also helpful, um, stomach wise and stomach acid wise. Um, cause again, I, I, I see sometimes people going low carb have certain B, like I, I worry some with some of the B's that they struggle to potentially get if they're going super low carb, um, or even minimally low carb, maybe they're like 75 grams or something or 100 grams, but need a little bit more to be able to adequately get some of the nutrients, whether that's like vitamin C or B1 or some of these ones that could be a little bit trickier to get on like a keto style diet. Yeah, well, and that's a big reason, one of many reasons why we preach just getting back to nutrition 101 level stuff. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be specific to your named condition or named disease. It it could really just be nutrition for healthy humans. And then if you do that, you end up being a healthier human. Right. As unsexy and unglamorous as that is. Mm-hmm. I know we all kind of, in a weird way, we crave the pizzazz of a prescriptive diet, but they're overused. So Yeah, and... Yeah you know, giving yourself the opportunity to, to experiment and see, okay, within the context of that 101 plan, are there different things that feel better to me versus like not as good to me? Because I think giving, um, without necessarily hyper analyzing every sensation or feeling that you're having, it's still really good to be able to assess like, oh yeah, I generally feel really good eating what I'm eating. Um, Maybe it's even just swapping, like sometimes people prefer to eat more of the carbs later in the day versus earlier in the day, um, or vice versa. Like there's a lot of different things you can experiment with dietarily um, that isn't just, I'm going to remove all these foods, which tends to be the knee-jerk reaction in the gut health space. Um, But actually trying to experiment with different um, dietary I wouldn't even say interventions, but different like tweaks just to see if you feel best eating one way versus another way. Um, But yeah, it, it can, it's usually simpler than you think. And maybe little things like, oh, when I eat more protein, I feel a little bit better. That kind of stuff can be really valuable and might take a little bit of experimentation and just kind of listening in and trusting what your body is sending, trusting the signals your body is sending you. Um, yeah. Which yeah. I think a lot of times is lost in this world. <laughs> yeah, very in true. In part because a lot of the folks we work with have some degree of anxiety or health OCD and they're like really terrified and really um, 
obsessing about their health in a not healthy way. Um, and those sorts of things generally don't promote trust in your own body and your own experience. Right. So it's, it's easy to get to this place where you don't trust your body and you're not going to listen to your body from that sort of angle. But also you go to doctors and they tell you it's all in your head or, oh my God, you've had, you know, oh, my G the GI map shows you've had so and such and such all along. Right. And we Your are whole knew, life. <laughs> yeah. We only knew because we've ran this test and you need to pay me for another test real soon. Or like you've had SIBO all this time and you didn't know. Uh. Right. Like just the, the kind of scary markety nature of especially functional medicine, unfortunately mm -hmm. with their testing um, that also tends to, build distrust in one's body. Yeah. How, I mean, if we had a nickel for every time we have been told somebody's story and they said, I was diagnosed with SIBO and we treated the SIBO and I felt great, but then we did the follow-up breath test and it was still positive. And then I was really defeated and then we had to treat it again. Like how many times have you heard that scenario <laughs> where the person symptomatically felt better Yeah, and they kept hammering the snot out of something anyway, because the tests kept showing a positive result and nobody mm. was questioning the validity of the test. Right. Right. So I think that kind of stuff where, again, you, you treat the SIBO, you feel better. You think, hooray, I did it. Your body is telling you, hooray, I'm done with this but then the test result tells you otherwise, like that sort of thing really messes with your head and your ability to trust your body and your perception of things. So yeah, I, I no, think 100%. A, a lot of the folks that we work with are in kind of a jam when it comes to that in the beginning, but yeah, I think it can be relearned. I think it can be relearned in, <laughs> I think it's something that is a goal and you might have to <laughs> You might have to fake it until you make it to some degree of, because a lot of times in the gut health space, um, all the focus is on very negative, like typically like negative sensations, negative feelings, um, uh, trying to get better. Like it's almost focusing so much on what's going wrong versus what's going right. So just shifting the focus to on like, hey, what what made me feel best versus like what makes me feel worst? Yeah. Worst. What makes me feel worse? It's I was going to run with it. It's all right. I know. I love you anyway. What makes me feel worst? Just kidding. What makes me feel worse? I mean, well, if you could give it a hierarchy like that and you know the one thing that makes you feel the worst, then right. by all means... You know, that might be a tidbit of information that's useful, but yes, yeah. what just in general makes you feel worse. Right. I agree. I think it's like the negative spotlight versus mm -hmm. glass half empty versus ha glass half full. Right. It's like a perspective change. So mm -hmm. if you could change your perspective around nutrition and just things in general to be focused on, okay, like what's going right or what makes me feel best? Um that can be really helpful because then you're putting a lot of the focus on your goals, which is to feel better, to, um, you know, work towards uh, goals and passions and hobbies and things like that. And, and you're taking baby steps towards that and focusing on the things that are going to get you there versus just getting stuck in a loop hyper focusing and being hyper vigilant around symptoms and what's going wrong and that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and this might be a, a touch woo, but I know I've heard in coaching circles and, mm. and more like mindset ish focused Instagram accounts, you know, they'll talk about how what you focus on, you amplify. Right. So if you focus on the positive, you will start to amplify that in your life and it will grow. But if you focus on the negative in your life, it will amplify and it will grow. And that's right. where people get really stuck and they spiral and they go downhill pretty quick. So right. yeah, I think just a shift of focus, it doesn't have to be overnight and it's not going to feel easy and wonderful at first. Like if you've been in a really negative kind of headspace, the first step might just be to try to make an effort to be a bit more neutral. 
Yeah. And maybe that's your first step for the first month or two is just not even glass half full, glass half empty, just like, okay, there's a glass. <laughs> and, right. and maybe if you could pepper in a little bit of curiosity with that mm-hmm. neutrality, that's probably a good first step. And then after a while, you could start to kind of graduate to genuinely trying to look on the, the bright side of things, but it, it can be uh, easier said than done for some people. Right. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, I think there is one more thing I want to make mention of on this episode. Um, there is another reason why you could have low stomach acid. So again, we've talked about uh, some of the unsexy basics, nutrition, in ad- nutritional inadequacy, sleep, stress, maybe even things like movement and sunlight and stimulating your nervous system, blood sugar, blood flow, like a lot of really basic stuff that can lead to low stomach acid output. Um, But I think that the other one that we should make mention of, albeit a little bit briefly, is you can have autoimmunity against the cells that produce stomach acid. Mm. And that is a whole other, you know, can of worms that we could open. But um, basically, if you wanted to, okay, hold on. If I say it this way, everybody's going to go and run and check on this. It's not a super common autoimmune disease. Right. It's not uncommon, but it's not common either. So it, don't think that you necessarily have this. But I'm just saying this exists. It is a thing. And you can test for it relatively easily. LabCorp and Quest both have a test that's not terribly expensive. It's called antiparietal cell antibodies. Mm. So parietal cells are the cells in the stomach that make stomach acid. Antiparietal cell antibodies are the antibodies directed against that tissue. If those come back elevated on blood work, then there's some indication that you have some autoimmunity against those cells in the stomach. And if that is the case, I think it means two things. A, it opens up this whole wide world of kind of treating this with an autoimmune bend to it. Mm. So maybe paying more attention to things like vitamin D, vitamin A, glutathione, maybe thinking about some anti-inflammatories like turmeric or resveratrol, um, you know, that sort of angle, I guess, that you might not otherwise think of with low stomach acid. So A, I think that there's the autoimmune kind of treatment component of it. As a side note, I'm not necessarily a big proponent of like AIP or restricting your diet for the sake of autoimmunity. You can try to go gluten-free, maybe dairy-free and see if that has an impact. But beyond that, I probably wouldn't go hog wild. Um, But the other thing is, if you have had this autoimmunity, maybe for a while, It actually might be that you need some betaine HCL as a Band-Aid for a prolonged period of time slash maybe forever. And knowing that can be helpful. Um, Mm. It's sort of akin to if you've had Hashimoto's for 37 years and your poor thyroid gland has not been able to produce adequate thyroid hormone for 37 years because of an autoimmune attack, you're probably just going to need to take the Levo for the rest of your life, right? You need to replace the thing you're not able to produce anymore. Um, or like a type one diabetic. Once, once you become a type one diabetic, you kind of need the insulin indefinitely as far as we know. So those are the two things I thought I would share about the autoimmune variant of low stomach acid. Again, it's not, it's not the most common autoimmunity. It's not uncommon either. Luckily, the testing is pretty easy and pretty cheap to do. You just have to ask your provider to order it for you or do something like direct labs and order it yourself. Um, but that is out there too. So thought I'd make mention. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good mention. Um, I have one other, which again, I feel like we talked about it last time. So I'd just mention it. Um, there are people, I, I think H. pylori gets a little overdiagnosed in the functional space, but H. pylori is a microbe that can lower stomach acid it, acid. I also think it generally is going to inhabit people that already have lower stomach acidity. Um, but it makes an enzyme that can lower, or I should say raise the pH of the stomach. So it lowers the acid, makes the stomach more basic, um, and can really be a factor that 
an underlying factor that's driving low acid for some individuals. Like I said, I think it's heavily overdiagnosed in the functional space. Um, some providers treat it on everybody, it feels like. Um, but it is something that I do think is relevant to some people that I've worked with, that it might be really helpful to work on um, clearing the H. pylori and healing any tissue that needs to be healed because um, H. pylori can cause like ulcers and gastritis. So healing the tissue could potentially help, but just eliminating the H. pylori in and of itself is going to be helpful for um, bringing acid levels back to where they need to be. Yeah, that's an excellent point, too. And I agree with you. I think that it's overdiagnosed in the functional space. Um, we have talked about cases privately before where, you know, somebody does like a GI map, for example, and it's negative for H. pylori, but then the practitioner is like, well, I still think you have it, so we're still going to treat it. And it's like, well, why the hell did you do the test then? Right, right. <laughs> um, I, I definitely think the GI map just overdiagnoses H. pylori, period. Mm -hmm. So that's another factor. Um, it's it's a tricky little bug, but you're right. It's going to lower your stomach acidity and keep you further entrenched in that land of low stomach acid. And it does that to promote its own survival. It's a smart little stinker. So mm -hmm. uh, for some people, just getting rid of the H. pylori can go a long way in their stomach acid battle. Right. No, yeah. totally. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's about a wrap, my friend. I mean, we could probably go on and on for quite a bit longer, but I think that is sufficient, certainly, for the low stomach acid conversation. Uh, tune in next time, guys. We're going to take a little bit more of a, a look-see-loo at PPIs specifically, and then uh, we have other fun topics in store for you throughout the fall and winter and beyond. So, you know, keep tuning in. We're here every week now. The summer slowdown has officially long since come to an end. Right. And we are back to posting every week. So I hope we see you in the next episode and that one after that. Until then. Mwah.